Welcome to the Victor Emanuel Nature Tours webinar. I am Ben Reynolds, host and organizer of the event webinar series. Thank you for joining us today. We are delighted to offer this educational presentation and we hope you enjoy today's topic on Understanding Sport Optics, Binoculars 101. Let's welcome our main presenters, Clay Taylor and Ben Lizdis from Swarovski Optic. Hey everyone. Good, good afternoon or morning, wherever you are. During this session, all attendees can ask questions, but please note that questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. However, if you have technical questions during our session, I'll try my best to address them in real time to help you have the best viewing experience. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to view on demand anytime at your convenience on our Victor Emanuel Nature Tours YouTube channel. A link to the recording along with a special discount offer for Swarovski Optics will be delivered to you in an email tomorrow afternoon. Now, back to our feature presentation. I would like to introduce you all to Clay and Ben. Clay Taylor grew up in Connecticut and started photography in 1970. And once he had purchased his first 500 millimeter lens, he aimed it at the birds in his backyard. That led to a passion for birding and eventually leading birding tours across the US and Canada. In 1999, he became the birder at Swarovski Optic North America attending bird festivals, leading bird walks, and still taking lots of bird photos. In 2008, he moved to South Texas in order to get away from winter and replaced his Connecticut backyard blue jays with Texas green jays. Now that smartphone cameras and digital SLR cameras can work wonderfully through a spotting scope, the challenges and enjoyment of birding and bird photography are as fresh as they ever were. Ben Lisdis has been heavily involved in birding and birding optics in particular since 1999 when he began working at Eagle Optics. After 18 years of helping birders outfit themselves with the right binoculars and spotting scopes, Ben went on to join Birdwatchers Digest, wearing many different hats from ad sales director and content contributor to podcast host and field trip leader. He is enthusiastic about his current position as the business development manager at Swarovski Optic North America, where he is working to develop the Swarovski Optic brand among a broader audience of nature lovers and outdoor recreation enthusiasts. Thank you both for joining us today. Thanks for having we, us. We are thrilled to have Clay and Ben present on binoculars. We hope you enjoy the webinar. Without further ado, we will turn to their presentation. Take it away, Ben. Thanks, Ben. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Show the screen here for everyone. And away we go. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Um, so uh, like Ben said, my name, my name is Ben as well. And uh, Clay and I today are going to go through really kind of like a basic understanding of um, sport optics, in particular binoculars. And one of the things Ben asked me to do is to say, well, what is sport optics? Why is, what's that term even mean? Because a lot of people aren't familiar with it. Um, it's an industry term that essentially refers to binoculars, spotting scopes, and rifle scopes. And sport optics within the outdoor recreation industry is separated from things like eyeglasses, goggles you might use for skiing, et cetera. So sport optics, like I said, binoculars, spotting scopes, and rifle scopes. And with that, let's kind of get into a little bit of the, what we're going to talk about today. And uh, before we get started, I would like to thank um, the folks at Vent, you know, Ben and Victor and Barry and everyone for hosting us today. We really appreciate the chance to um, talk to you guys about this stuff. And what we're going to talk about today is we're going to do an overview of the concepts uh, behind binoculars and spotting scopes, what the terminology is, what the parts are. We're going to work on defining quality, kind of one of those nebulous things in some people's minds, what quality means in optics. Talk about tips and tricks for more effectively using your binoculars and having a better experience. And then, like Ben said, we'll have some time for questions and answers. So um, I'm going to go ahead and get started here and we're going to look at the parts of the binocular. So real quick, we've got on the part that you put up to your face, you've got the eye cups. Those are what you put up your, eye, your eyes up to to look towards the ocular lens. That's going to be the small lens in the back side of the binocular. 
The opposite of that ocular lens on the front side of the binocular is the objective lens. Uh, real simply say the objective lens collects information, the ocular lens magnifies it. Uh, in between the two barrels, you've got a center hinge, which is adjustable to accommodate differences between your, uh, or to accommodate the distance between your eyes. Everyone's face is shaped different, of course. Um, you've got a focus wheel to focus from near to far, and then you've got a diopter in the binocular, which um, the job of the diopter is it's a adjustment to adjust the right side of your binocular to match the focus on the left. This is to accommodate for any differences between your left and right eye. And later on in the presentation, Clay and I are going to talk a little bit about how to adjust that diopter. Um, it's kind of a one-time setting. You know, you use your focus all the time, whether you're focusing on a distant gull or a raptor to a hummingbird or a sparrow within, you know, 10 to 12 feet of you. Um, whereas the diopter is a, a focus adjustment you make once and you wouldn't need to change it unless um, there's a change in your eyes or if someone has borrowed your binoculars and changed your diopter setting. All right. So let's see. First, we're going to go ahead and talk about the numbers. Clay, you want to tell us about this? Okay. Um... Thanks, Ben. And hello, everybody. Good to see you all. Uh, hopefully you're having a good day. Um, so I used to work in retail. Ben used to work in retail. I started in retail before Ben did. I started in 1977 at a little camera store. And one of the constants we get with customers all the time is they don't understand really what the numbers mean. So all binoculars usually are designated by a number times another number, 8x32. 10x42, like on the on the on the uh, display there. The first number is the magnification. The second number is the size of the front opening, which is light gathering. But what I told, what I figured out years ago to tell people, if you don't remember anything else about this entire program, remember the numbers mean how big times how bright. So, how big does it does the binocular make it? In this case, it's, it's the 10 by 42. I look through it, I look at my, with, with my naked eye, through the binocular, the bird is 10 times bigger than my eye sees it. So the magnification is 10. The next number is the size of the front opening, but it depends on, it, it, and it gives you how much light the binocular brings in. So this is a 10 by 25 binocular. Same power as this one. If I even do this, do, get, get kind of crazy and line these babies up, I can see that the bird, I am looking outside my, my, my window in my backyard, the birds are about the same size. So they're both are magnifying the same, but since this has a bigger front opening, it gives me a brighter picture. How big, how bright? Everybody loves big. Problem is the more you magnify, the more you magnify your shakes and your jiggles. So if you've got a binocular that's too high power and you can't hold it steady and you can't see the details, I'm not sure that was a good choice. Um, so definitely when you're playing with a binocular, look at fine details, really study them. Don't just kind of be, Wandering around going, oh yeah, I can see stuff. Is can you see the fine details? If you can, that means you can hold it steady enough. The brightness part is, is interesting because depending on the scene, some binoculars are going to give you a much brighter picture than others, and we've got some more slides that are going to show that. So so this slide right here, just a magnif uh, an example of magnification, and essentially that concept of magnification or power, that first number, you know, is how much bigger do the binoculars make something that I can see with the naked eye. Sometimes people are tempted to jump to the question of how far can I see with these binoculars, which is really a difficult question to answer because it's all a matter of scale, right? So you can see the moon with your naked eye, which is hundreds of miles away. Um, whereas, you know, a butterfly 10 miles away, you're not going to be able to see. So it's not so much how far you can see, but um, how big, once again, the image is going to be as you see with your naked eye. You know, interestingly enough, so in when I grew up in Connecticut, the East Coast, east of the Mississippi, we sell far more, way back in the day, seven power binoculars because eights didn't even exist. But pretty much sevens and eights are, are the majority of, of our sales east of the Mississippi. West of the Mississippi, we sell a lot of tens. People have longer distances to see. They've got clearer air in which to see it. Um, so the 10 becomes more popular. Um, and so you never quite know what a what a specific customer's needs are going to be or their wants because a lot of times power is up in the head. Um, if you like high power, you're going to expect high power. And if we give you low power, even though it's a brilliant, beautiful wide field of view, you may go, eh, am I missing something because I'm not getting my 10 power here? So you got to be happy. So on the on the second side of that equation, you know, we have that um, 
objective lens size. And as Clay alluded to earlier, there's trade-offs going between big and small. And we're not talking about image size now, we're talking about binocular size. So here we've got a 10 by 25 and a 10 by 42 binocular. So like Clay was showing you earlier, they're the same power, but you can see the difference in the objective lenses. One's a compact binocular you can put in your pocket. The other is going to be a larger binocular that you're going to be wearing around your neck. The trade-offs are, you know, we all like things that are small and portable and lightweight, but uh, the smaller that front lens, the less information is getting through the binocular to your eyes, which is why as birders, we really like 42 and 32 millimeter binoculars because we all know that birds are most active at dawn and dusk. So we really want that larger objective lens to collect the light. So um, better low light performance with the 42s, but more compact and portable with the 25s. And that's just a trade-off. And one of the things you'll see in this presentation as we talk about these things with binoculars, there's always trade-offs. There's not always a, this is the best configuration. This is the one size that everyone wants. Um, you're always gaining a little bit of this and losing a little bit of that in whichever way you go. When it comes to magnification, um, the trade-offs are gonna be a wide field of view and steady images versus greater details. So you can see in these slides here, as I increase the power from left to right, going from zero magnification, eventually up to 60 magnification, my field of view is narrowing. I'm not able to see as much to the left and to the right of the bird. So if I'm looking at flatter shorebirds, for instance, um, I'm not gonna be able to see as many shorebirds in my field of view as once as I increase the power. So you're gonna have that constriction of your field of view. The issue with steady images gets that fact that as you increase the power of your binoculars, any movement of your upper body gets magnified. So you're going to get a bounce of your image. And at the end of the day, that's going to result in seeing less details, actually. Um, this is why spotting scopes, which operate at really high powers, need to be mounted on tripods. Um, and then once again, you know, the trade-off, though, is greater detail, particularly with birds at a distance. And I want to talk about exit pupil. And I, exit pupil is, um, so this is going to be the, the only math that we have in this presentation. This is a really worthwhile concept to understand because it really talks, it speaks to the relationship of objective lens size and magnification. And the exit pupil on a pair of binoculars is the shaft of light that exits the backside of the binoculars and hits your eyeball. So how much light actually gets the surface of your eye? And it's a factor of both magnification and objective lens size. So this binocular here in the slide, the 10 by 42. And if you ever want to see the exit pupil of your binocular, just hold it at arm's length away from you. Um, up towards the light source. Don't ever hold it at the sun, um, but you'll see a, you can kind of see it there, Clay, yeah, and you can see it in the slide. You'll see a, a shaft of light in the backside of the binocular. That's the binocular's exit pupil. All 1042s will have the same exit pupil, 842s, and the, that number is determined by dividing the front lens size, in this case, 42 mil millimeters, by the magnification. So in this case, 10 power. So a 10 by 42 will have a 4.2 millimeter exit pupil. That's a shaft of light that hits your eyes. So you can see as I decrease the power to an eight power, I'm gonna get about a five millimeter exit pupil. So even though these two binoculars have the same size front lens, collecting the same amount of light, a little bit more light gets to your eye with a lower power because it has a larger exit pupil. And exit pupil is, has a lot to do with brightness. It's always gonna be relative to your viewing conditions, right Clay? Yeah, and, and here's that's the tricky part because the other part of the optical system is your eyeball, your iris, and your brain controlling the whole deal. So um, you may have a so I've got a I've got a 10 by 50 binocular here. 10 power divided 50 power divided by 10. This gives me a five millimeter exit pupil. But if I'm on a I'm on a beach, uh, human's eye pupil on a sunny day. If I'm on a beach on a bright sunny day looking at shorebirds. There's so much light there, my eye closes down. So the size of my pupil may be only two or three millimeters, whereas the beam of light that that, that binocular is projecting on my eye is five. So I'm not getting as bright of a picture as <clears throat> the binocular can give me because my eye is saying, this is enough, I got enough. So on a bright sunny day on a beach, the little guy, my little 10 by 25, might be just bright enough because this is that 2.5 millimeter exit pupil. So why would I want to bring the big guy down to the beach on a sunny day when I can bring the little guy and have a lot less weight? Back in another lifetime, I was an optics, uh, I was a physics major, and the number one simplest formula in optics is the size of your front lens determines the maximum sharpness you can get from any image. So while the both of these give me 10 power size but birds, 
this one with the 50 millimeter front opening is twice the size of the 25. This will give me twice the detail. So why big and heavy? Bright, yes, but also more detail. And for birders, sometimes having more detail is worth that little bit of extra weight to haul around. Uh, and again, that's the choice you need to make on your own personal view. You know, for me, I take the 50s in the field a lot because I'm, I carry cameras and gear and junk, so I'm not really that that weight conscious. But some people are, are, are you know, thrilled with looking through this. But I'll tell them, look, if you even have to think, do I really want to bring that with me today? Don't buy it. Buy one you're going to bring. You may have to, you may go down to a 32 millimeter, but it's going to be with you at all times. And that's the binocular you want to have, the one you have with you, not the one that's back at home or back in the, in the car because you didn't want to walk with it. So. Yeah, it, it, I, I would say getting to that when it comes to these trade-offs with binoculars, one of the things that I always tell people you want to prioritize is comfort. You have to have a pair of binoculars that you're comfortable handling, holding, and carrying around. That's kind of priority number one. So um, if it's a compact binocular, great. It's the binocular you're willing to carry around with you out in the field. Um, but if you, you know, the only binocular that you have is a bigger, heavy binocular because you wanted that best resolution possible, but it's just such a pain in the butt to carry around and you don't like using it that much, you know, perhaps not worth it. But uh, what's the, yeah, the other slide shows on an overcast day or very cloudy or sunrise, sunset, really early, really late. Here we are. And you need that big old beam of light coming out of the back of the, of the, of the binocular. So. Yeah. Um, a lot of it will depend on your style of birding, what you like to look at, when you like to look at it. Um, over on the hunting side of our of our market, they do a lot of hunting in, in really low light. So, you know, big old monster 15 by 56 binoculars are, are, we sell a ton of these out west because of their magnification and their brightness in really low light. Not a birding binocular by no, by no stretch of the imagination, but there are certain models that do better with a certain need. And I'd say the majority of birders find they're really well served by a 32 or a 42 millimeter binocular. Those are going to be the popular size. So when it gets to different binocular designs, you have two different um, major types of construction that you see out there. A portal prism binocular, which you're seeing on the left side of your screen here, and a roof prism binocular that you're seeing on the right. The portal prism will have this profile that's shaped kind of like an M, like you're seeing Kate, uh, Clay holding up, or a W if you turn it you know, the other way around with, you know, with the jog in the barrel, whereas a roof prism, the two straight tubes. Um, and just a word on what prisms are, you know, prisms are these pieces of glass that you will never see in your binoculars, hopefully, um, uh, that are in the center and in the middle of the binocular. And the, the reason they're important is that without prisms, everything you looked at would be upside down and backwards left to right. Yes. So, um, so the, the prisms allow you to see things correctly on land. Uh, when you're looking through telescopes at plants, they don't have prisms in it. But if you're seeing Saturn upside down and backwards, you really can't tell. Um, but if the you know chest side warble you're looking at is upside down and backwards, it gets pretty annoying quickly. So that's what that's the job of a prism. It's uh, orientation. So it's not magnification or light collecting. It's more image correction. Um, so, and, and we'll talk a little bit about portal prism versus roof prism as we look at some of the different features of binoculars, whether it's field of view or close focus, waterproofing, there's some differences between them. These days though, um, almost all the binoculars you're gonna be seeing out there that birders are using are roof prism binoculars. They're more feature heavy, they're better suited for the field, right Clay? Yeah, and you know, Swarovski Optics first binocular back in 1949 was a portal prism because that's what yeah. everybody did back then. Even though the roof prism dates back to 1910, um, but the, the big challenges with, well, the, the number one, if you, if you look at the diagram down there and, and trace the little ray trace that's going through, the other, the other feature that the prisms do is that they shorten the overall length of the unit. If you didn't have that prism in there, your binocular would be this long. We now shorten it down to this big, so it's now more, more compact and portable. Um, the other, and, and the advantages of a Poro are they are extremely efficient in bringing the light through, 100% light transmission, they're wonderful. The difficulty is they're hard to make rugged. The prisms knock out of alignment really easily. They're easier to make and so less expensive, but they're harder to, to waterproof. They're harder to make close focusing. There's a lot of stuff that you that what we're taking for granted nowadays in birding 40 years ago wasn't there. I mean, I, nobody, nobody sold a binocular on eye relief back in the day. Nowadays we do. Coral prisms are harder to do with eye relief or you never saw them designed with good eye relief. So there's a lot of little design stuff that goes back in there, but primarily in the market nowadays, most most 
uh, binoculars, our poros, our roofs, the straight through design, the waterproofness, all that cool stuff. So now that we have a kind of an idea of what the numbers mean um, and the different sizes of binoculars, some trade-offs there and different styles or constructions of binoculars, now we can kind of look at some of the specifications as it might relate to those things that we just learned. Um, we're going to talk about field of view, eye relief, close focus, and waterproofing is really some of the key specifications that we think birders are really going to find most critical to using their binoculars. And we'll start by field of view. And as you can see from the picture here, you know, field of view is going to be um, essentially how far you can see to your left and to your right through the binoculars. Um, it's often measured at how far can I see, you can see at your left and right as in feet at a thousand yards. So, you know, 8 by 42 binocular by brand X might have, four, but might list their field as uh, field of view as 420 feet at a thousand yards, just as an example. Um, it's also expressed angularly. Uh, you might see on, on the binocular, it's like a six degree field of view, but typically it'll be feet at a thousand yards. Uh, field of view is going to have a correlation with magnification, not objective lens size. So you might be tempted to think, boy, the bigger the lens in that binocular, the more I can see to my left and to my right, and that's not true. Um, but the job of that front lens is strictly information gathering. Field of view is gonna have a lot more to do with power. The lower your magnification, typically, the wider your field of view is. Now, field of view is one of these specifications on binoculars. It's gonna vary from make to model, like um, like the weight of the binocular might vary from make to model. So, you know, we talked about exit pupil where we said all 842s have the same size exit pupil. You can't say that all 842s have the same field of view. So that's a specification you just need to look up for that particular make and model. I would say there's no downside to a tremendously wide field of view. It makes your binoculars really easy to use uh, in terms of following birds that are in flight, focusing on them that are in flight, finding birds in dense habitat. If you go to the tropics or somewhere where you're looking at birds where there's a ton of vegetation that all looks the same, the bigger window you can get to find that bird that you saw with your naked eye, the better. So um, in terms of uh, poro prism versus roof prism, poro prisms with their barrels spaced further apart tend to have a wider field of view. That's going to be one of the advantages of a poro prism, but we're seeing some outstanding developments here in roof prism binoculars that can have some amazing field of views. Our new NL Pure binoculars have a field of view. I'm not sure, I don't recall what the figure is exactly clay for the 8x42, but it's astounding. It's like, yeah, 400, how much? What do we got? The, the new 8x42 NL Pure has a 477 foot at 1,000 yards field of view. Yeah. That is by far the best in the entire birding arena. It, 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 it used to be 420 feet. When someone would say 420 feet at 1,000 yards, that was mind blowing for an 8 power binoculars. So 477. So, um, you know, so that, that's why I said field of view, look at the specification because some binoculars do better than others, right? So, from a practical standpoint, what field of view means, and I'll go back to the, to the little compact versus, and I'll, and I'll pick up an NL Pure. Um, these are both 10 power. So, as I look through them, the birds out there are at 10 power. The field of view is the size of the, of the black circle that you see, that's your edges of your picture. And on that compact, it's kind of like this. Even though the bird is the same size on, my, on the NL Pure, it's like that. You can see way more to the right and way more to the left even though the birds are still the same size. So big field of view, I'm a big field of view guy. And actually this binocular that I held up earlier, this is my original binocular that I bought back in 1977. And it has a 550 foot field of view at a thousand yards. It's an old seven by 35. So I love me some wide field of view. And but the, the neat thing is, especially with the industry not having been into big fields of view in the last couple of decades, Handing somebody the NL Pures, the first thing they do when they look through it is, oh my gosh, it feels like I'm in the picture. I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not fighting with the edges, trying to look. I'm, I'm in the picture, and that's the really cool thing about it. The tricky part about field of view is you can get really wide field of views, but it's much harder to do with good long eye relief. And the neat thing about the NL Pures is we did both. We're going to talk about eye relief in a second. These old things had probably a seven or eight millimeter field of view. Uh, eye relief, they didn't even have retractable cups. Um, nowadays, we have 19 millimeters and all that cool stuff. So the technology has gotten better. And Ben said there's, there's no, there's no, this is, there's no, how'd you put it? There's no impediment to having field there's, of view. I, I can't think of a downside of a wide field of view. They're more expensive. <laughs> okay, there, there's <laughs> the that. Harder, the harder lens to design. So, it's you know, true. that, that and we'll pay for more field of view. There's no two ways around it. But for me, I, I'm a scanner. I love big field of view. Totally worth every penny. 
And, and I will say just, you know, this may be obvious, but I may be stating field of view isn't just how much you can see to your left and to your right. It's also top to bottom. You know, okay. it's the entire circle. So it's not just a scanning left to right, but top to bottom as well. Um, and really talk about comfort, makes your binoculars really comfortable to use. Um, so eye relief, Clay just touched on eye relief for a little bit here. Um, and uh, eye relief as defined, you know, the technical definition of eye relief, it's the distance from the back side of the um, binoculars, from the ocular lens to the surface of your eye. Um, and this is a binocular is designed or engineered to work in a certain way with, a, with an optimal distance. And eye relief is measured in millimeters. It's going to be one of those figures like field of view in that it's going to vary between makes and models and amongst different manufacturers. So there's no generalization, um, you know, in terms of uh, all 842s have X field or eye relief versus tens. Um, eye relief the, is something that's really important for eyeglass wearers. So if you're wearing eyeglasses, if you think about this, your eyeglasses essentially act as a barrier for getting the ocular lenses up to your eyes. So they push the binoculars out. So you want binoculars that are designed to work at a certain minimum distance from your eyes. And really that minimum distance that we look at is 15 millimeters as being the magic number. So we like eye relief that's gonna be 15 millimeters or greater particularly for eyeglass wearers. Um, there's no downside if you're not an eyeglass wearer for a long, a long eye relief, but critical for eyeglass wearers. And if you bird and you're wearing sunglasses, you spend time in bright sunny places. I've done a lot of birding with um, sunglasses on. Uh, you know, even though I'm not an eyeglass wearer, typically uh, uh, that long eye relief is really helpful. So, uh, in terms of how you'd want to use your binoculars, if you're an eyeglass wearer, they have these eye cups that twist up and down. You want to be sure that the eye cup is rotated down. So as you look at this image that we have on the slide here, the top image is with the eye cup fully extended for the non-eyeglass wearer. Eyeglasses on, we want the eye cup retracted, and we're allowing that, those eyeglasses to make some of that airspace or distance between the um, lens and the binocular itself. In terms of... Yeah. Yep, and, and I get a lot of people that have been glasses wearers, especially longtime birders. Birders have been doing it for decades, and back in the day, very few binoculars had really good eye relief. So to them, it was it was it was a pain. A, a buddy of mine who who still to this day, when when he birds, he does this constantly, like 150 times a day. He's putting his glasses up, and I go, Jay, why can't you put them? He says it just bothers the heck out of me. I said, okay try a really good new binocular that's got a lot of long eye relief and you're going to see because there's a there's a reason to wear your glasses if you are just far-sighted or nearsighted obviously if you're if you're like mr magoo and you're and you're nearsighted you don't want to be walking through the woods and tripping over rocks and sticks and stuff like that so you need to wear your glasses tip you, if you're just far-sighted or nearsighted you don't have to have the glasses on because your binocular focus wheel can make that adjustment for you but if you have an astigmatism, any kind of an astigmatism, and ask your eye doctor, then what the binocular will not do is correct for your astigmatism. So you need the glasses on, and then you can adjust your eye cups to do the, the, the correct distancing for that. And one of, the, one of the neat things about the brand new NL Pure binocular, it's got this little weird little dude up top here. This is the forehead rest. This is, this is something that Swarovski Optic just announced with this binocular first time and it is whoever whoever came up with this idea back in Austria I hope he got some kind of a bonus or a medal because this is genius because now instead of just having your hands you can run this thing out and put it on your forehead and if you're a glasses wearer you can adjust it so your eye cuffs are not banging into your glasses because I know my sister wears glasses and she it drives her nuts that she keeps pushing her glasses back on her face with her binocular with this thing you can set it up at just the right distance get the entire field of view and also you get an additional point of stability on your head for, for more stable viewing. I so, would say that the, the, the forehead rest gives the binocular harness a run for its money in terms of looks kind of goofy, but highly functional. <laughs> yes, and, it, and it, does, it does detach too, if you don't want to have it on or want to store it on. But um, I, I, like I say, when, when they came out with this, I went, oh boy, somebody over there is a genius. That, that was just a <laughs> real neat thing um, to yeah, do. And so it's that third point of contact yeah. helps. All right. So the other um, one of the other features. Oh, and 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 just getting back to eye relief real quick. Um, almost all full size binoculars that you see out there these days work really well for eyeglass wearers. If you are looking at compact or pocket binoculars, that's still a segment of the industry where you don't. You often see a lot of products that don't have great eye relief. So if you're an eyeglass wearer and you're looking for um, a compact binocular, you're going to really want to pay attention to that specification. 
Um, our compact binoculars have, I think it's like 15 or 16 millimeters of eye relief, so they do fine, but um, it's more difficult somehow to manage that long eye relief in compact binoculars. Um, let's, let's talk about close focus. I think of close focus like one of those things like um, field of view where there's no downside in having a good close focus. This isn't a compromise uh, feature of binoculars so much, you know. So um, while all binoculars can focus on infinity, the horizon, the moon, they're all going to have limitations in terms of how closely they can focus. And this is going to be one of those specifications that, once again, like eye relief or field of view, will vary between makes and models. Um, unlike field of view, where you could say, oh, lower power turn has a wider field of view, et cetera, there really is no impact on close focusing um, by magnification. Um, so it, it's a uh, you know close focus eight power ten power easily doable on there uh, for bird watching and nature observation I say kind of a minimum of, of twelve foot close focus within ten feet is ideal and if you guys have all been on any of the uh, uh, Victor Emanuel nature tours tours you know their their field trip leaders are looking at everything they're looking at they're talking about the plants the ecology the the bugs you name it and so having a close focus to be able to look at lichen or insects or butterflies um, nothing but a great asset. In terms of portal prism versus roof prism, portal prism binoculars with the barrels spaced further apart, the point at which your your view, your each barrel can converge is going to be further away from you. So portal prism binoculars typically have a poorer, no pun intended, close focus. Um, so that's another advantage of the roof prisms right there. Uh, any other input from the butterfly master? That would be you, Clay. <laughs> um, well, there's a couple of things that usually go into it, and uh, years ago, Brunton Company had a had a full size uh, 42 millimeter binocular that focused to three and a half feet. Well, the problem was it was so close you couldn't even get the barrels close enough to see it, so you literally had to go one eye. So it became a one eye monocular for three and a half foot close focus. So um, there is there is a minimum at point at which focusing becomes difficult. Now, um, in, in the case of our, our, uh, our 42 millimeter EL binoculars, these were selling for um, $2,600 back last summer when we introduced the NL Pures. And both of them were minimum focus of six feet. When we wanted to price the ELs a little bit farther away from the $3,000 of an NL Pure, Austria said, okay, we can bring the price of this down to $2,200 but you're going to lose some of your minimum focus. There is there is some mechanicals and things that go on in in there that make it more expensive to do a good a good close focus binocular. So they they brought the close focus back out to ten and a half feet on these, and they dropped 450 bucks from them. So yeah, it, it's so many things that we see of, of a binocular when it comes from the manufacturer. We don't know the, the design and and uh, uh, manufacturing. And, and other types of considerations that went into why it is and how much it costs. So yeah, you can you can do you can do amazing things with some of the optical devices, but it's just how much are you willing to pay for it? It's kind of like a car, really. So um, so for me, close focusing is, is essential. I'm a butterflyer, um, so for me, and, and six feet is fine. I, if I'm going if I'm going out doing butterflies, I'll take my ten powers. If I'm going to do just birding and butterflying, I'll probably go with the eights because I'm a low power wide field guy. But if, I, if I'm doing butterflies, I know there's a butterfly right there in front of me. What the heck is it? I don't have to search for it. I don't need a big field of view. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go in there. So um, my sister in Florida actually is a birder and a butterfly. She has two binoculars. She has a regular one and she has a little tiny uh, compact one that focuses really close. So, you know, uh, again, you, you have tools for the job. Yep, and and you know once again I'd say you're going to be good if you're like 12 feet or so, but you want to look at that specification because what you don't want is a pair of binoculars with a 15, 16, 17 foot close focus because I've been in so many situations with birders that have these great high end binoculars from the day that were designed when binoculars were designed for hunters, you know these old Zeiss or some of our old Swarovski binoculars that have like a 15 foot close focus, great optics still, but on some field trips everyone's you know looking at. A sparrow that just popped up over here or you know bells vireo and the shrub right over here and there are people that have to kind of get behind everyone so they can get their binoculars in focus so definitely pay attention to that specification um another feature to just to be sure your binoculars have is waterproofing it is so versatile adds to the longevity of the binoculars i mean you you know binoculars are one of the few instruments these days that are purely mechanical you have a lifetime warranty on them they can last a long long time but uh, waterproofing 
goes a long way to add the longevity of binoculars. And, uh, you know, waterproofing, essentially, it, it, uh, it not only is it, our waterproof binoculars fully sealed, but also they'll have nitrogen or inert gas in between the lenses of the barrel to eliminate any moisture from condensing inside the binocular. So waterproof and nitrogen purging, the nitrogen purging prevents fog from getting inside the binocular. So you might see fog proof. It doesn't mean that the outside air to glass lens surfaces are incapable of fogging up. If you have, um, you know, if you're in Belize and your, you know, your cabin at the lodge you're in is, is air conditioned and your binoculars are in your cabin and they're really chill the morning you're out alberting, when you go out to that hot, humid Belizean jungle that morning, your outside of your lenses will fog as that glass gets up to temperature. So when we say anti fog or fog proof, it's internally fog proof. That's important right there. But um, even if you never plan on getting out in the rain or getting your binoculars wet, people who live in Arizona, you know, these dry, dusty areas love waterproof binoculars because it also keeps all the dust out. So it's just a way of keeping those air to glass lens surfaces inside the binoculars clean and dry so that the optics on the inside of your binoculars, which you can't clean, um, are just as clean and dry 10 years down the road as they were the day you bought them. So it adds this longevity to your binoculars that is well worth it, like I said, even if you don't plan on burning in inclement weather. Um, and waterproofing is literally submersible. Uh, we're not talking about water resistant, we talk about waterproof. Uh, Clay, any other thoughts on waterproofing? How, how sure. wet can you get these binoculars? <laughs> uh, we just did the San Diego Bird Festival and they did a pelagic trip. Um, if you've done enough pelagic trips, at some point you're standing up on the bow of the boat and boom, a wave comes and just co coats you, covers you. And salt water will kill any binocular. Don't, don't let anybody fool you. Um, if you go burning on the beach and the, and the wind is blowing the sand and the salt, and you get it all over your binocular. The sand and the salt will kill. The salt will get in your focusing mechanism. Uh, the sand will. The nice thing about waterproof is with us, undo the, unscrew the, the eye cups, turn on the faucet, stick the entire binocular under the faucet, get a toothbrush or a Q-tip and scrub the darn thing off. It's waterproof. Yep. You, can, you can make sure that you're, you're good and you're, you're not getting stuff inside of it. So yeah, uh, yeah. And, and like Ben said, you know, 15, 20 years ago, very few companies were doing waterproof except for the very high end. Um, most are, are doing it now, especially if you're, if you're birding and hunting um, and, and the, the nitrogen purging. So the nitrogen can, I mean, the seals can fail and the nitrogen can leak out and you just don't know it. And then all of a sudden, poof, the right side of your binocular uh, uh, fogs up because you just went to Costa Rica. Um, yeah, we can always fix that. That's covered under the warranty anyway. That's part of the mechanicals of the binocular. So that, that's always doable. Oh, and by the way, the, the trick that I learned years ago from Fred Sibley was when you're going to do a tour to the, to, to the tropics and you're in your nice air-conditioned room and it's really hot and really muggy outside, store all your binoculars in the bathroom and close the door because usually the bathrooms don't have an air-conditioning vent. So all the binoculars in the bathroom are at nice outside temperature. When you take them outside, then you don't get full fog up. Last thing I'll say about waterproofing <laughs> is that even though the binoculars are submersible, they don't float. So if you drop your binoculars overboard, while the binoculars might be fine, you're going to have to retrieve them. So <laughs> word to the wise there. All right. So there we covered our binocular specifications. And like I said, you know, there's probably other specifications out there, but I think those are really the ones that birders would need to pay attention to and be mindful of. But now let's talk about quality. And what quality addresses is why you could have an 8x42 waterproof binocular with good eye relief and a five foot close focus that sells for $300 and why you can have another roof prism binocular 842 long eye relief waterproof etc that sells for $2,000 well what's the difference and that kind of gets into the quality which has everything to do with how you experience bird watching so quality what contributes to the quality well you know we'll spend a little bit of time defining what quality means but what matters in terms of quality are going to be things like optical coatings the, the glass that's used in both the prisms and the objective and the ocular lenses systems. And then you get to the quality of builds, so the mechanical precision of the binoculars, the durability. Um, and then lastly, you know, the impact that that all has is cost. Like I said, why is one binocular that looks identical in specifications on paper um, $200, whereas, you know, another one is going to be $2,000. So, you know, you got to get something for that money. So that's going to be quality, essentially. Um, at Swarovski, Wilhelm Swarovski was the founder of Swarovski Optic. 
And one of his sayings that we constantly use in the company is still kind of a guiding star for us is constantly improving what is good. So it's this quest for constantly making things better. Every time that you can come out with something new, it should be better than what you had. It's that pursuit for just getting better and better. So quality is something, and, and certainly if you shop for binoculars and you've, you've looked at our binoculars at Swarovski, you understand our price points. We're a company that really, our benchmark is quality. That's kind of our, our guiding star there. So looking at the grade of the optical lenses here in this picture, you can see um, a prism, you can see a objective lens, you can see an ocular lenses. So the grade of the glass, the raw glass that's used, will have a lot to do with um, the quality of the image. Uh, higher grade glass is going to be denser, heavier, more difficult to work, more expensive to buy, but um, that'll have one impact on quality. Yes, heavier. <laughs> and, uh, at, and then on top of that glass, is on all the air to lens, uh, air to glass surfaces, you have optical coating. So when you look at these binoculars here, you see they reflect kind of a greenish color, yellowish color. Those are the anti reflective lens coatings that are on the binocular. Well, like I said, they're going to be on all the air to glass surfaces. Um, some binocular manufacturers might have two or three lens coatings on some air to glass surfaces. With some of ours, we get up to how many lens coatings do we get up to, Clay, on some of these air to glass lens surfaces? I, you know, it, it doesn't, right? They'll, they'll never. Never tell us, but the rumors are it's up to sometimes 40, depending on yeah. where it is in the optical box. Oh, yeah. oh and, and, and a dirty, dirty little industry secret: those that picture down there with the greenish reflections. That greenish reflection is put in by Photoshop because our 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 lenses just don't reflect that much. So, but, yeah. but, the, but for, for 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 magazine ads and all that stuff, everybody always puts a reflection in there, so you know there's actually glass in it. Just but like but you but you will you will see some of those you you can look at the, your objective lens and see those coatings and sometimes it will have a greenish cast to it sometimes it has like a bluish or purplish and there's no rule of thumb in terms of oh you want binoculars with green anti-reflective lens coatings versus you know purplish ones or bluish ones the only thing I would say in terms of lens coatings that you would want to avoid as a birder is any binocular that you look at that has a red um, anti-reflective coating on there it's like a kind of a ruby red coating those are coatings that. Um, you'll typically see on pretty inexpensive binoculars that give you the appearance of a brighter image because they've washed out all contrast. Um, but, and, and as a result, too, the color fidelity is horrible on them. So if you're looking at higher quality binoculars, it shouldn't really be an issue. But if you ever see those ruby red coatings on binoculars, that would be sort of a, a no-go sign for me. But uh, the idea of those optical coatings is they maximize the amount of light that goes through the binoculars, minimizing the amount of light that gets reflected at the end of the day, resulting in more information getting to your eyes. Um, the higher quality of the coatings and the more lens coatings will add to the cost, but at the end of the day, you're gonna see a lot more detail. And so here's kind of how the glass and lens coatings might have this practical application for you as a birder. Um, you know, so these are some of the impacts. And so we'll look at resolution. So resolution is simply how much detail the binoculars can resolve. And Clay mentioned this earlier when we were talking about objective lens size, that larger objective lens on binoculars allow better opportunities for resolution. Well, gla glass types and lens coatings also can do that. You can see on this goshawk here, the image on the left it's sharper, you can see a lot more detail. Whereas if you, on the image on the right, it's a little bit more blurred. You start seeing some of the barring and some of the texture of the bird's feathering blending into one another. And you can see exactly from a birding application, especially when you're looking at some birds with, you know, winter plumage, um, you know, shorebirds, for instance, where you're kind of really looking at some of the plumage details, how resolution can be critical, right? Okay. Anything else to add on resolution play? Um, no, that's pretty much it. I mean, sharper is always better. And mm -hmm. the other the piece, you know, getting way back to the power again, um, you can have a phenomenal glass, big old 50 millimeter, lots of resolution. But if you find that you're not hold, you can't hold it steady enough, then maybe either go lower power or put it up on a tripod mount. Mm -hmm. and that way you can get rid of get rid of the motion and be able to see more stuff. So there's, there's okay. no, ways to get around these things but it depends on again your solution not necessarily your best friend or your your birding buddy's solution and a good practical um sort of tester way to compare resolution of two binoculars or and just a way to understand it is i will often tell people you know go out somewhere and find a row of evergreen trees pine trees that are going to be 200 yards away from you and in one binocular you'll see it and you'll be like oh yeah i can see the pine tree etc 
but the needles kind of clump together. Whereas you can take a binocular that resolves really well and all those needles are kind of, you see the texture of the tree so much better. Um, and for me, that's been kind of an easy thing. Maybe it was because when I was at Eagle Optics, we just had pine trees out of the way. We just look at them to compare resolution. But, uh, you know, certainly uh, it just, it makes it just more comfortable on the eyes. Contrast, on the other hand, is unlike resolution, contrast has more to do with color fidelity, brightness. So once again, the same goshawk left to right, you can see the bird on the left has greater contrast. The, the, the brightness of the, of the orange in the eye, the, um, the various hues of the tawny brown and the cream colors of the, of the plumage, there's more contrast there. And I think of contrast too as being like if I'm looking at blue-gray gnat catchers, a uh, binocular with a lot of contrast, I can see a lot more blue in a blue-gray gnat catcher, whereas in inexpensive or low contrast binoculars, they all tend to kind of look great. Um, that tawniness in a brown thrasher, those kind of hues of red that you can see in a brown thrasher, you can see better with a binocular with better contrast versus low contrast binoculars, they all kind of look a little bit more of a muddy brown. Um, the blacks are blacker, the whites are whiter, and you have a bigger range of tones in between. So that's, that's exactly. Really and that's that's really what the the coatings on the lenses do. I think we've got a chart coming up that shows a little bit of why that happens. Yeah. But it's really good. Uh, here comes the, here comes the light. Yeah. Yeah. So 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 the, these these coatings maximize light transmission. How much light gets through the glass. Um, so uh, on this image here, you've got this this red line, which is the light path here, going from left to right through this piece of glass right here in the middle. And you can see any time light hits a surface of glass there'll be some reflection. Some light will bounce off the surface of the glass. But the ideal binocular will have as much light passing through the glass as possible. And what's coming out the back is ultimately what gets to your eye. So maximal light transmission is what we're looking for. And once again, better contrast, better resolution as a result. Clay? So yeah, so, the, so the, like on that, that one, I made that my snarky little comment about the green on the lenses there. Um, the, that first little arrow bouncing off is the one that you would see a reflection from it. The yeah. second one is the tricky one because notice that it's bouncing off inside the lens and it'll come over and then bounce again. And so it's going to ricochet back and forth through all the lenses. So if you have a lot of uncontrolled light going on inside of your, your lenses, because we've got, remember, multiple lenses going on here, that's what kills the contrast. So that yeah. really nice sharp goshawk that had really mudded, muddy, muted tones might have all kinds of internal lens issues. It, it's easier to make a sharp lens than it is to make a good contrasty lens because really the, the, the coatings are the secret sauce with Swarovski optic. I mean, lens design is lens design. A computer can tell you how to cut that lens to do something, but then, then putting all those coatings on, and that's what they'll never tell us, the formulas, the numbers, anything like that, because Going back to what, what Wilhelm said, constantly improving what is good, we're constantly improving those lens coatings, constantly. So I think we got another slide coming up and talk about that. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and I, and I would say that, uh, you know, those lens coatings too, Clay was saying that they're the secret sauce. I would I'd probably argue that precision is the secret sauce because, you know, whatever you can put on lens coatings to a certain degree of precision that's involved in uniformly applying them, having the glass perfectly ground and polished into the right curvature or in the case of persons flat, whereas the precision of the construction sort of allows you to take advantage of those premium lens coatings. So precision and lens coatings kind of go hand in hand. Um, here we're talking a little bit about what you're seeing with some of these um, high grade glasses. So you'll see some manufacturers offering HD glass, which is kind of more of a marketing term, it stands for high definition, but people can understand that more than when they hear the term ED, which would stand for extra low dispersion. Um, I think there's a general industry aversion to using the term ED because of its more popular affiliation or connotation um, that we all know about with the Viagra commercials and whatnot, where, you know, ED kind of has already been taken, you know, publicly. So people like HD, but it kind of means the same, which is a higher grade, denser glass. And you can see on this um, objective lens here that we have pictured on the left, when the light passes through it, you get this spectrum spread, if you will. You know, we know that light is not like a laser beam of like one color, but it's a spectrum with purples and blues on one end and reds on the other end. And whenever light passes through glass, it disperses, um, which is what you're seeing here with the, your kind of wider rainbow piece. So when it hits your eye, you've got a lot of what we call secondary spectrum. Extra low dispersion glass or ED glass means that when the light passes through the glass, it disperses less. So when it gets to your eye, it's essentially a tighter band of the wavelengths 
And the result of that is you get less chromatic aberration. Um, chromatic aberration is a really fancy term to discuss kind of what we're seeing in this slide right here, where on this bird on the right, uh, you're gonna see this kind of purple color flaring at these co high contrast areas right here on the bottom. You kind of see some red up toward the top. Once again, you know, the purple to the red in the spectrum there. Um, that's gonna be chromatic aberration. It essentially, chromatic aberration can really mess with things like contrast, for instance, where you have a lot of layering of black on white because you can get the color flaring around the black on the white. So if you're looking at a crow perched up against the sky, for instance, you can see the color halo all around the crow where that dark bird is silhouetted, silhouetted against that light sky. A really high grade glass and really high grade lens coatings can virtually eliminate, eliminate that chromatic aberration, which is gonna allow you to kind of see a lot more detail in really some of the worst lighting conditions, backlit conditions, things that are overcast, that type of thing. Anything to the add there? Key there? The key there is the word virtually, because some manufacturers will say eliminates color uh, aberrations. No, you can't. That's physically impossible. I was a physicist, but you can minimize them to the point where they are so hard to see that a normal human being can't, or the lab lab equipment can, something like that. But yeah, yeah. Um, and and depending on on the, the type of type of subject, it, it can become more or or less of a problem. Um, uh, and the camera guys get big into their their chromatic aberrations and what corrections their lenses have. So mm -hmm. yeah, and, and I would say kind of get into a place that you can get rid of it, but or you can't get rid of it, but you can minimize it. Chromatic aberration as much as you can see it in some lighting conditions in binoculars, you know, medium quality one versus a premium binocular, in spotting scopes, it's even more noticeable because not only are you magnifying the image, but you're magnifying all the flaws and defects of the glass that happens when, when light passes through glass. So, um, you know, I would say really makes the case for if you're going to get a spotting scope with all that magnification, a real high-end scope, uh, is going to be the impacts of all that power on those optical defects is much more minimized on the high-end equipment. And chromatic aberration is one of those things that you can really easily see um, in medium to lower tier spotting scopes. Um, but, uh, you know, like I said, it'll be situational too, depending on the viewing conditions. Yep. Uh, another thing that you can do to optimize your image quality is by using field flattening technology. So we talked about field of view and how much you can see to your left and right with binoculars, but you can put field flattening lens elements in binoculars and spotting scopes that give you a sharp image to your left and to your right. So typically on binoculars, you can look in the center of your field of view and you can get a really nice image, but as soon as things start getting to the periphery, they'll get distortion, they'll start, you'll know, feel the field curvature, and you'll also get just a drop off in resolution. The image will blur. And you can kind of see that on this slide here as we look at the dragonfly. On the uh, right-hand side, you can see the reeds bending. It's kind of a standard off of the glass, kind of, you know, still nice and sharp right here in the middle. But with field flattening lenses, as you go to the edge of your field of view, north and south, left and right, you maintain that image sharpness. You maintain that correct, um, you know, the, the, essentially that flat field. So it allows you to get these panoramic, really sharp views. Great if you're scanning um, you know, sh you know, flocks of shorebirds, et cetera, where you kind of want to look at clusters of birds, but also I'd say just generally nice to look at. And a lot of birders say, well, what do I care about being sharp in the edges? Because I'm looking, wh when I find a bird, I'm going to move them to the center of the picture anyway. I said, sure. But here I am, I'm scanning the trees, looking for warblers, and I've got a nice black burning warbler dead center. And all of a sudden I get a little hint of, hint of a color and a little bit of motion out on the corner of the, of the picture that a nice sharp image will let me say, ooh, look at that. Here's a uh, Cape May warbler. Let me go look at him for a minute. Um, so even though we're not actively looking at the edges, our eye and our brain are scanning and looking for stuff. So the sharper images you get out to the edges, the better you can do. That actually, the whole uh, field flattener thing started with the EL Swarrow Visions in 2009. And um, before that, nobody in the sport optics side was using field flatteners. The astronomy guys were doing that all the time because when they want to take pictures of their star fields, they want all the stars to be equally sharp out to the edges. And a lot of people, when we announced this with the Swarrow Vision ELs back in 2009, they said, "Well, you know, that's this, this, there's some compromises there. It's going to make make your field look funny as you as you pan back and forth." And you can see from the from the the dragonfly thing there, um, it, it it is different if you're used to a curved typical curvature lens binocular and you put a field flattener up and you go back 
back and forth. Something weird is going on and your brain's not used to it. But after I've used those for, for a couple of months and picked up our old ones that didn't have fuel flatteners, like, oh, gosh, that looks weird. Everything's going all distorted on me. Yeah. So it's, it's what your brain is used to be seeing. Um, nowadays, on the high end, fuel flatteners are pretty much de rigueur. Yeah, yeah. It's once you get used to using field flattening lenses, um, it's hard to go back. <laughs> that's for sure. So, um, so those, those are all like the benefits you're going to get optically, yeah, as you're looking through things. But then when you look at the high price tag of binoculars, the other element of quality is build quality, and this has to do with the um, the precision of all the moving parts, the quality of the materials that are used, whether it's the the uh, the metal alloys that are be, uh, being used, the rubber armoring, et cetera, the precision of all moving parts, the way the eye cups move in and out, or the barrels hit, twist um, up and down on the binoculars. And, you know, it's pretty easy. You can hand someone a, a $300 nice, you know, mid price for a prism binocular and a pair of our Swarovski binoculars, and someone can just handle them and hold them and figure out which is the more expensive pair of binoculars without even looking through them because you do get all the feel of a really pre precise instrument. And while it's nice in terms of it just, it feels nice and operates better, uh, the longevity of the binoculars, the shock resistance, the waterproofing, all the mechanical components of a binocular are just made that much more durable and in particular I would say reliable when you've got binoculars with really great build quality. And for the traveling birder, this is really important because you don't wanna be on a trip in South Africa well, you know, once in a lifetime trip and have a pair of binoculars fail. Um, so durability is, I would say, something that is really key. And um, it goes hand in hand with that lens quality. So I'd say that, you know, one of the things you're you're seeing a lot of professional birding tour guides using ELs or, you know, NL Pures or real high-end Swarovski binoculars or other high-end brands. And it's not because as a birding guide, they're making so much money that they can afford the best binoculars, but rather they're using their binoculars so heavily, so thoroughly that they really need to have the reliability. And over the long run, it pays for itself because they're not wearing their binoculars out. Oh, and by the way, you get the best views possible. But I think that's one of the reasons why you're seeing a lot of professional tour guides using high-end binoculars, not because they're so well off, but because the quality really is actually in the long run, um, it's just the way to go. Absolutely. So we've got that little um, over there, uh, the, 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 the bone of, of, of all the pieces that go into the binocular. So Swarovski Optic, we buy the glass, we buy the magnesium, um, we we machine all that, we shape all that stuff like the rubber eye cups and the and the uh, front covers and stuff. We we have suppliers make those. But in the entire process, so we have a lady down there looking through the binocular with a whole bunch of them. She's one of the final assembly checks uh, before the binocular is done. This binocular right here, 8x32 EL, last time I took the, the company tour in Austria a few years ago, um, we went through the whole thing and we met, uh, one of the ladies' name was Marta. Um, the last check off that she does is the 132nd signed off quality control step with this binocular goes through before it gets put in the box to be sent. So 132 different people have looked at various things on that binocular, the lenses, the machining, the, all that stuff, made sure it's exactly to what the Swarovski uh, family wants, because this is still a, a company owned, a, a family owned company after 70 years as optics and over 110 years as crystal. And a, a Swarovski family member wants to make sure that they don't get somebody walking up to them on the street and go, boy, I bought one of your binoculars and they suck. No, that never happens, never happens. 132 people make sure that that doesn't happen when, when this goes in. So that's that's part of the reason why some of our stuff is so expensive, but it also is part of the reason, like Ben said, you know, if you go to Costa Rica, if you go to South Africa, you go India, someplace like that, unless something horrendous happens to your binocular, you probably are going to come back with it in just as good a shape as when it left, and you're going to get some great views while you're doing it. Yeah, very true. All right, tips and tricks. We're going to have to kind of blow through this click. So I'm looking at the time, and Ben's going to come back on with like the little hook and kind of loop us off stage here if we don't hurry up here. So, yeah, yeah. So just some additions to consider for binoculars and accessories. You've got tripod adapters, which if you want to mount your binoculars on a tripod for a steadier view, you can. Not very practical for the bird in the field. Any of you who carry a spotting scope with you know that lugging around a tripod and a scope is no fun. But um, certainly if you're looking at stars or if you want to do some distance viewing with both eyes, you don't want to look kind of squint with a spotting scope, tripod adapter, binoculars. Cleaning or kit. You're watching, you're watching a bird nest in your backyard. 
Yeah, you, know, you can totally. Totally. You can watch the babies getting fed and stuff like that, and, 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 and you're much more stable. Yes. Cleaning kit, pretty self-explanatory. The harness strap. Now, you know, we talked about the forehead rest as being, you know, one of those things that with birders, like, boy, that's kind of dorky, but hey, you know, functional. Harness strap the same way. Um, uh, as my friend Bill Thompson used to say, it both lifts and separates, but essentially it takes the weight off of your neck, distributes it across your shoulders, holds the binoculars close to your chest, um, you know, it's just a, one of those things where once you go into using a harness strap, it's hard to uh, go back to the hanging binoculars around your neck. Uh, another accessory you, you can get for binoculars is these uh, variable phone adapters. So you can get adapters to hook up your um, smartphone to your binoculars. I think you maybe need a third arm to be able to manage the focus of the binoculars, hold the binoculars and operate your smartphone. Um, I'd say better suited for spotting scopes, but um, it's certainly one of those things that you can do with your binoculars. And then let's just get to a little bit of kind of getting back to the diopter on a binocular in terms of um, kind of some tips and tricks for using. So the basic fundamental fu fundamental function of a diopter is to independently adjust the right eye to match your left. And it's a one-time setting. And the way you'd want to do this essentially with any, and, and the diopter on a lot of binoculars, it's, it's located on or below the um, right eye cup, okay? That's your traditional place for a diopter. On a lot of the premium binoculars these days, a little bit more of a sophisticated design is to have a diopter that's going to be located within the focus wheel in some way, shape, or form. This will vary between makes and models exactly where the binocular is located or where the diopter is located. But no matter how the diopter is designed, the functionality is the same. It's going to work like this. What you want to do is you want to find a object that's at a moderate distance, not the moon, not something 10 feet from you, but maybe, you know, 50 yards out. Um, and get it good and sharp using the focus wheel and just using your left eye. You can stick a lens cover on the right barrel to, to block the view of the right barrel. So you're just looking, both eyes open, just looking through your left eye though, get it good and sharp. Then what you wanna do is close up the left barrel and look at that exact same object with the right barrel. Once you got the right barrel focused on that object, then um, you can see is it just as sharp. If it needs to be adjusted, you don't adjust the focus wheel, you adjust the diopter. So once again, the right eye matches the left. Once you have that set, it's like adjusting your car seat when you go to sit in your car. You don't need to adjust it all the time. You just need to adjust it at once and it's set for you to just go and drive. So whether you're focusing near or far beyond that point with the center focus, you shouldn't need to adjust the diopter any longer. But uh, don't forget about it and be aware that's there. If you're wearing eyeglasses, you probably don't need to have your diopter set beyond the neutral point because most eyeglasses will compensate for differences between your left and right eye. If, you're, if your eye doctor did his job right, since you have a left prescription and a right prescription that brings your eyes to be normal, then that would bring the binocular to set the zero for your, for your diopter. So as long as your prescription is current, set your diopter to zero and don't worry about it. Make, yeah. it, make life a lot easier. Yeah, I'm gonna kind of blow through some of these. I know Ben has a video that talks a little bit about some of these binocular use concepts here that um, that he and Victor put together. But essentially, you know, the other thing is keep your eyes on the prize. So essentially stay focused on the bird that you're seeing. Don't drop your head to meet your binoculars and then look up here. That's gonna be problematic. And then brace yourself. Uh, when you look through your binoculars, don't have your elbows hanging out to your sides. Um, you know, try to bring them in a little bit closer to your body to get some of that bracing. That adds stability is really going to help, um, whether you're using 8 power or 10 power binoculars. Another little trick is you can use your binocular as a macro lens if you're into botany or dendrology or want to look at bugs. You can turn your binoculars the other way and look through the objective lens and use it as a magnifier for these little small things here or there. So um, for those of us who are curious about all of nature, as I'm sure most of you are, uh, it's, a, it's another great little thing you can do with your binoculars midday if the birding is slow and you want to take an eye towards plants or bugs, which I love doing. But ultimately, and we're going to kind of be wrapping up our part here, um, I would say kind of get into the take home message here for binoculars. I would say it's all about ease of use in terms of what is going to allow you to see the most detail. It's not always about power. So ease of use could be a number of things. Ease of use could be having a wide field of view, having steady images, being able to hold a pair of binoculars steady. Um, you can see more detail. So once again, as you lower the power sometimes, that's gonna be an easier binocular to use. 
Um, other things that contribute to ease of use are going to be things like intuitive ergonomics. When you pick the binoculars up, are they comfortable in your hands? Um, when you want to quickly get on the focus wheel, does the focus wheel precise and responsive and um, you know do what you want to do? Um, that kind of gets into mechanical precision. And ultimately, you know, getting back to this durability, you want binoculars that are going to be highly functional and that are going to be there for you when you are enjoying them most. You don't want to be spending a lot of time out in the field paying attention to your binoculars. You want to be attention, paying attention to the experience you're having. You don't want to be paying attention to those great field trip leaders that uh, Victor and all those guys hire. You're going to want to be doing other things than fidgeting with your binoculars. Your binoculars are a tool to give you access to the greater wonders of nature. So um, by having something that's easy to use, precise, durable, um, you can just kind of get the binoculars, let them do their thing, and then you do your thing. My recommendations for binoculars, um, 832s. I love 8x32 binoculars. I find them to be the perfect combination of lightweight and portable, as well as doing really well on the brightness, particularly if you're looking at premium binoculars like our binoculars. It's kind of like you can have your cake and eat it too. You can have a mid-sized binocular. And even with that smaller 32 millimeter lens, the light collecting is so good and the light transmission is so good that it's brighter than a lot of other 42 millimeter binoculars. So that's my that's my personal pick. I love 8x32s, um, but 842s and 1042s, you know, those are other really good choices for birding. I would say, you know, ideally, I'd have an 832 and a 1042. It would be my my ideal one. But uh, don't get too hung up either on some of the differences between 8s and 10s. You know, we're talking about the differences between them here, but I don't want to overstate them. They're subtle differences. They're both very usable. I would probably avoid things like 15 power binoculars for birding, really high magnification, probably avoid those. But, um, you know, I go with a roof prism binocular. Waterproofing is essential. Uh, you know, a reputable brand with good service. I mean, Swarovski Optic, we make really good stuff. We're used to customers who have high expectations and our customer service is catered towards people with high expectations. And ultimately, um, as nice binoculars as you can afford, uh, these are durable instruments that you can have for a long, long time. They'll outlast your computer, your camera, your cell phone, your car. Um, there's no mechanics involved in these, no software updates, and uh, they will have lifetime warranties. So any any thoughts on that from you, Clay, in terms of your any personal recommendations or, or thoughts before we get to the Q&A part here? Yeah, uh, and just just like you, I mean, my my travel binocular has been the eight by thirty two, but then I always paired mine up with the twelve by fifty when I went out on festivals or on field trips and all that. Actually, I took them to Ecuador when we did that Ecuador tour, and the big thing is I had my wide field of view, easy to hold, lightweight, but then I also had the much brighter, much sharper, much narrower field of view for really detailed viewing. So I I basically. The analogy I make is you, you can play around a golf with a five iron and you can play around a golf with a five iron. It's just that. It's just around the golf. It's not a lot of fun. You can actually have different binoculars to specialize in different things. You don't necessarily have to have 3,000 binoculars, dollars binoculars for everything, but you can have a little pair for butterflies at super close focuses. You can have a wide field for travel. You can have a couple of things and be able to pick which one optimizes your viewing for today's use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. The, the the binocular sales salesman in me says get one of each. <laughs> you know, the, the practical person would be like choose wisely. So <laughs> I, I, I cheat since I work for the company and I do festivals. I do have one of each, but and, and that actually gives me the luxury of picking which one I want to take with me on any yeah. given day. Yeah, totally. All right. Well, that wraps it up for us, folks. So um, I can start getting your Q and A stuff ready. Thanks for sticking with us for um, this presentation. I think Ben's going to come back on here and. Uh, We'll address some of your questions. Like I said, I think he's got a couple more things to say along with a little um, video that uh, I think he and Victor put together talking about um, some of, you know, binocular use stuff, adjustments, et cetera. So. Yeah, I want to thank you guys, uh, Clay and Ben, for that wonderful and informative presentation. Oh, and you're welcome. It is our pleasure. And uh, I would like to ask the audience to send in questions. Uh, we'll be addressing uh, questions here in just a few minutes. I would like to turn now to our company owner and president, Victor Emanuel, who will give a demonstration on his method of finding a bird in the binoculars. Oh. All right, I think I just switched the presenter mode over to you, Ben. Got it, here comes the video. And after the video, we will answer questions. I've been leading birds tours for over 40 years and 
I've had a number of people on the tour that have trouble getting a bird that is being pointed out, out to them in their binoculars. So I've developed a little technique that I share with them video. on how you get the, what you're trying to see, the bird you're trying to see in your binoculars. And I say, imagine, for example, that the bird you're trying to see was in top of this juniper tree right here. And the key is you keep your eye on the bird. You do not move your head. You keep your head still. And you, this is the key word, raise the binoculars parallel to your line of sight and interpose the binocular between your eye and what you're trying to see. And that should be in the binocular field right away. And to show you a what it really involves is you cup your hand like it's the a binocular barrel and you're looking at the top of this juniper and you raise your hand and right away in your field of view is the top of the juniper because it's part of your body it's an easy thing to do but with binoculars you have to do it where you keep your eye on what you're trying to see and interpose the binocular between your eye and what you're trying to see. The mistake people make is they're looking at that bird on top of that juniper and they raise the binoculars, but they have them at kind of an angle like this. And they raise them up at an angle, not parallel to their line of sight, but at an angle. And then at the last minute, they put them up and they're trying to find what they're trying to see with the binocular up and they don't find it and it's flown by them. So that's the key thing. Keep your eye on what you're trying to see. Inter don't move your head and interpose the binocular between what you're trying to see and your eye. And it should be in there right away. But it takes practice. Do it over and over and over. And each time it'll be easier for you to get what you're trying to see right in your binoculars right away. And it's important to be to do it quickly because if you take too long, the bird could fly. So that's my technique. And people have told me that my lesson on how to do this, even people have been birding for 20 years, it's been very helpful to them. And it particularly works very well if you have Swarovski binoculars, which are some of the best binoculars in the world. And you use them to interpose them between your eye and what you're trying to see. Well, great. Well, thank you for that, Victor. Uh, and now we'd like to go to questions. All right, we got a question here uh, from Shelly. She says she has a 12 by 50 set. It's too heavy for me. Uh, it shakes in the hand. Uh, can you show how it mounts to the tripod? I know, Clay, you had that tripod mount. How easy is it to take that on and off? So, so that just wraps over. Yeah, essentially that's like a platform that you can put on your tripod um, and you put the binoculars on top of that platform. There's like a large rubber band, for lack of a better word. It's obviously much more sophisticated than a rubber band, but um, that clamps the binocular to that. And, and you know, I would say that, you, you know, if you, if you find that the binoculars are a little large and heavy to use, if you add a tripod to the equation, you're going to solve the problem of holding it steady. However, you're going to be adding a, quite a bit of additional weight to the setup. And I would say that you maybe want to consider something smaller and lighter weight to complement those. Once again, an 8 by 32 I mean, the 1250s are great. And on a tripod, they do fantastic. But getting to that concept of easy to use, easy to walk around with, um, you know, having something you can handle and carry and hold and the quick access of binoculars is what makes them kind of a, a great complement to a spotting scope, if you will. So while the tripod mounting them can certainly address some of those issues, um, don't underestimate the value of having a pair of binoculars you can just like take with you when you go take your dog for a walk or like you, you can just, you know, grab at a moment's notice and not have to worry about taking the tripod with you, um, which would get to something with a smaller objective lens size probably 32, um, and then with the holding it steady, a lower power. So I think an 832 might be 
a great solution, but if you really like those backers otherwise and you want to get those 1250s going, um, yeah, tripod adapting to the app, they're out to go. Now, see, I'm never, ever going to tell somebody to not use their 12 by 50s because I love that Binaco from the very first instance I saw it, and I'm a low-power guy, so for me, that was unique. There is a way to do this, though, without having to bring a tripod or even a monopod, and if you ever go birding in Europe, especially northern Europe, they all carry what they call a fin stick, fin like in Finland, which the Finnish did it. And I don't have one. I've got one out in my garage right now that was made for me by the Amish guys. But basically, it is a stick that you're going to put onto your belt, and then you actually set the binocular on top of it. And so you're holding the stick with one hand, the binocular with the other hand, and they are remarkably, remarkably stable. And otherwise, it's just a little stick that you can put in your backpack and all that stuff. So. Um, you know, there's, there's ways there's ways to get around this. Uh, like I said, I, I personally love the 12 by 50s a ton, but I will use my A32s a little more than my 12 by 50s, depending on the situation. Hawk watching, 12 by 50s, absolutely. Shorebirds and 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 uh, sea watching, 12 by 50s. In the rainforest in Costa Rica, where I need field of view, the little guys. So, but um, a, a fin stick or something like that, or even just a little monopod. If you if you have a little camera, like a point and shoot camera. With those super zooms that you use a monopod with, you can you can actually use that as as a as a uh, a, a brace for your 1250. Marianne has a question. Uh, she says, "Can I have the coating of my 20-year-old Swarovski 10 by 42 binoculars checked and perhaps recoated?" <laughs> okay, um, they don't recoat anything. Um, but the good news is. Remember what, what, what Wilhelm said, constantly improving what is what is good. So our, our original ELs from 1999 then became the EL Swarovisions in 2009, and now we have the NL Pures. We're still making plenty of lenses to fit those early ELs, but the neat thing is you're not getting the 1999 coatings on those lenses. You're getting the 2021 coatings on those lens, those replacement lenses. So you can literally replace all four front the front and back lenses on your EL for something like $250 that you have to check with the repair department while they do a clean and check and all that on you. And you have all the brand new up-to-date coatings. One thing to note though, we're talking about lens coatings. They wouldn't necessarily be able to update it with like the field flattening lenses and some of that technology. So it's not a total refurb taking your older pair of Swarovskis and turning it into the latest pair, but it is you know, something you can do for, I'd say, a very affordable price to get your binocular, kind of some of those next steps. Yeah, because if, if you ever were to look through a, a 1999 and a 2080 EL, which was still the same bodies and all that stuff, there was a noticeable difference in the color and the clarity because they've been incrementally in, in improving those optics over that ensuing eight years. And all the glass we make nowadays is, always has the most modern uh, coding to it. So yeah. And, and one thing I would say too, if um, if any of you folks want to follow up too with some questions or get in contact with us, if you reach out to Ben, um, I'm sure you can pass along my email or Clay's email um, in terms of you know some of these follow-up things if you want us to direct you to our customer service department or things like that. So um, you know I, we'll we'll be available afterwards to help uh, kind of get into some of these nitty gritties with folks too. Very good. Uh, let me take this opportunity to let everyone know about our upcoming webinar. The upper Texas coast, particularly the high island area near Galveston, is legendary for its concentrations of migratory birds. Every spring, millions of songbirds migrate north from the American tropics to forests in the eastern United States, making an epic Gulf of Mexico crossing en route. Riding southerly winds, Many continue inland before putting down, but if they encounter north winds or rain, they seek immediate shelter along the coast. The result can be a staggering phenomenon known as a fallout. Large numbers of shorebirds migrate through this region as well, using tidal flats, coastal pastures, and rice fields as fueling stations before continuing north. In addition to migrants, this region's diverse coastal habitats and interior swamps and piney woods harbor a wide array of special nesting birds that make this area one of North America's premier birding destinations. Please join us for the next installment in our Vent webinar series, High Island Migration, Spring Birding on the Upper Texas Coast, 
and learn more about this fascinating corner of the country and Vent's annual tour here. Vent tour leader and National Birding Authority, Michael O'Brien, will present. And that'll be uh, just in time for a migration to be taking place. What's the date on that? April the 8th. I had a chance to go birding with a handful of the vent guides that I've been um, have the pleasure of knowing over the years. And boy, my, Michael is such a wonderful person to go birding with. It's like so knowledgeable and he imparts that knowledge so easily in such a unintimidating and unassuming way. Uh, any chance I get to go out birding with Michael, I jump at it. My problem with birding with Michael and Louise is half the time we end up looking more at butterflies than we do birds. <laughs> We have time for a few more questions here. Uh, and any of the questions that I don't answer at the end of this webinar, I will follow up with you an email or please reach out to me, ben at ventbird.com. Um, you want to say something about land, sea, and sky, or do you want us to? Yeah, go for it. OK. Um, so you know, the Mr. Eagle Optics over there, when Eagle closed and Ben you know, kind of wandered around in the birding world for a while before landing with us, um, when Eagle left, that was a major blow to bird watchers having a great source for optics and good people and good service and all that. Um, Land, Sea, and Sky, based out of Houston, has been in business for over 50 years. Their, their original name was Texas Nautical uh, uh, Supply. Uh, Tex yeah. Um, anyway, and they did they did uh, um, sextants and, and binoculars and, and timers from boats and all that, but they've become big in the astronomy world and very good dealer for us in the birding world right now. So all of the bird festivals that we do in Texas, Land, Sea and Sky is usually the official seller there. Um, they are the official optics supplier for, um, uh, for Houston Audubon. And they're the ones that are gonna be giving you, offering you the discount on the Swarovski optic products through the code you're gonna get. So they're wonderful people. Um, and normally when, when, when Houston Audubon does the high island migration days, in, in the end of April that uh, uh, Lancy and Sky is, is the guy that you talk to there and buy your stuff from. So they're great people. Um, and I, I would really highly recommend checking them out and, and uh, giving them your business because they deserve it. They're, they're really neat. Uh, Alan has a question. Um, he wants to know if there's gonna be a webinar on scopes. And the answer is yes, uh, we will be partnering again with uh, Clay and Ben in the future. Um, we're still working on a date. I believe it's going to be in May, uh, but we will have a Scopes 101 uh, webinar in the near future. And, and I, I think it's a great idea for a topic. I think a lot of people find Scopes to be really a little bit more mysterious than binoculars even. And a lot of the concepts we talked about today with binoculars apply right to spotting scopes. Um, I like to think of a spotting scope as half of a pair of binoculars on steroids. Uh, so it's so a very similar concepts, but yeah, I think we'll, we'll be doing a scope um, webinar because boy, you know, there are some instances in birding, I'm thinking of waterfowl, shorebirds, kind of these birds that you can't necessarily get closer to where a spotting scope I'd consider to be critical. And when I lead to it, I'm a scope guy. I actually bought a spotting scope before I bought a binocular. Um, but when I lead bird tours, and, and Michael and Louise can, can uh, attest to this, we'll be walking through the woods and I've got my scope and we're looking at birds and all of a sudden they'll stop, to stop and put the scope down and point it at the ground and say, hey, everybody come here, look. And they look through it and 12 feet away, there's a butterfly at 60 power and it fills the entire image and they go, oh, I didn't know you could do that with a scope. Oh, yeah. I'm a scope guy. I totally am. <laughs> oh, great. So I'll, I'll take one more question here. And like I said, I'll follow up with any question that we didn't answer for this broadcast. Uh, Donna asked, uh, could you comment on monoculars uh, for those with uh, one eye is better than the other and with um, low low visions? Yep. Yep. So I, I used to I used to get this question a lot. It's a great question. So. Um, you know, typically, the vast majority of consumers out there really prefer to use both eyes. For those of us and for the, you know, the majority of birds that don't have um, vision problems that prevent them from using both eyes, um, it's a lot more comfortable for us to, to not have to squint with one eye. So as a result, you see manufacturers, I don't care who they are in the optics industry, whereas they make binoculars to kind of suit 
a larger audience. And the monoculars that are out there are often very limited in terms of what's available because manufacturers are designing monoculars not to account for the minority of users that might be the exception who have a problem with one of their eyes where they just need to only use one eye. It's the larger market for monoculars, which is someone who wants something smaller, like literally half the size of a pair of compact binoculars. So as a result, a, down, a couple downsides of binoculars. One is you don't have the selection. It's hard to find them in full size. The quality out there, you don't get as, as many different price points in the monoculars. But also I would say that with the monocular, they're a little bit more difficult to hold steady because you have less real estate. You're going to have both hands on one thing. And so it's harder to focus and move it around. And when you can have one hand each barrel of a pair of binoculars, you're going to end up having something you can hold steadier. So what I would often tell folks who are really effectively only able to use one eye is get yourself a pair of binoculars and put a lens cover over the eye that you can't use. Because then you can take advantage of the benefits of the smorgasbord of quality and features that are out there in binoculars, because there's a whole lot more out there in binoculars to choose from in those aspects. You have something you can hold steadier um, and something that's probably gonna be more suitable for birding. In terms of, you know, if, if, if that doesn't sound appealing to you, if, if you really are dedicated to using a monocular, Opticron used to make a 42 millimeter binocular, and they may still, an 8x42, that's the only manufacturer I know of that makes a, what I call a full-size monocular. Um, other than that, I think what you're going to look at is really small little objects, which um, while being super portable, you're going to suffer in those low light situations. So um, yeah, my number one suggestion is use a pair of regular binoculars and just put a lens cover over whichever eye it is that doesn't work as well as the other. Yeah, back in the day, Pentax had a very nice 842, which was essentially their old 8x42 loop prism, only half of one. You know, people say, why doesn't Swarovski make one? I say, okay, $2,200, cut it in half. You're going to pay $1,100 for a one lens monocular? Probably not. Some people. Um, <laughs> maybe, but not enough. <laughs> for the people that are literally, you know, have no use of one eye and they say, I don't need an extra, extra binocular, extra size. Well, you know, so you buy a binocular, you're only using it for one. I like Ben said, use use the lens cover. But if you drop it and you smash that side, you can just flip it over and keep on using it. So, um, you know, yeah. there's ways to get around that. But typically, they're 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 more for for quick sightings than studying stuff. So if you're if you're taking a tour of Paris and you want to see the the frescoes of a of a of a roof of a of a, cha of a cathedral or something, sure, a little monocular can show you the details. But if you're scanning and watching, looking for shorebirds and watching for the hummingbird to come bring back food to the baby at the nest and all that, binocular vision, the, the depth perception and all that is, is uh, usually the way that, that it's a better choice. Well, wonderful. Thank you both. Uh, thank you, everybody, and uh, for joining today's webinar. And uh, we hope you all have a great day, and we look forward to seeing you again in the near future. See you, everyone.